Yeah. Okay. So my name is Safina Mfemo. I work for Sahara Ventures and So yeah, my name is Safina. I work for Sahara Ventures as the partnership lead. Uh, I'll be the host for this event. So it's so nice to have you all here and we appreciate your time. So just a bit of a background. This year, this is the Sahara Sparks Week and for this year, Sahara Sparks have partnered with My Growth Fund South Africa and we'll be having two days event, which will start from the 27th and 28th of this year, I mean of this month, meaning Friday and Saturday. On, on Friday, we'll have a couple of panel discussions and all, and then on the 28th, we'll be having the Sahara Sparks Marketplace hosted by Sahara Accelerator. So getting a bit of a concept of Sahara Sparks 2020 with the theme beyond Africa Beyond 2020. So we're going to play a teaser so that we can all be on the same boat. Okay, so now I'm going to welcome Mr. Pregod. Some of us do know him, and uh, Pregod is the managing director for Agritex. He'll do the opening keynote, and we'll continue the panel afterwards. Very good, Pregod. Uh, thank you, Safina. My name is Pregod Jeffert, and uh, the managing director of Agritex Company Limited. I would like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you to the panelists for offering your valuable time to discuss this topic with us to see how we can accelerate the adoption of agriculture into uh, the adoption of technology into agriculture uh, value chains. I'm supposed to give a keynote speech here, and I would like to do it in form in form of a presentation. So just we are, we all move on the same uh, speed. So let me share my screen with you all. I hope you can all see. Yeah, so. Before we talk about uh, technology in agriculture value chains, I would like to, to give a very brief note on what uh, Agritex does, because we are actually partnering with, with Sahara Sparks. So we are the co-hosts here, and I would like to familiarize everyone with our work. So Agritex, um, We are a company that deals with uh, developing technological solutions and our flagship product is uh, Smart Hydroponics, which is uh, focused on making climate smart agriculture affordable, profitable, and convenient. And uh, for just uh, a background in this, I would like to show you this so that you have uh, an understanding of why we are doing this, that 70% of farmers in Tanzania are highly vulnerable to climate change due to a dependence on rain-fed agriculture, leading to significant low and reliable and consistent productivity, and they are constantly unable to meet market standards. This situation is the same across Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we do is that we've, we have combined soil farming with the Internet of Things, 
which we call smart hydroponics, to make climate smart agriculture affordable, profitable, and convenient at both household and uh, commercial scales. So we are actually trying to de-risk agriculture by using technology. And we do that by uh, championing affordability of the systems, profitability, and convenience uh, so that you are actually able to farm regardless of where you are and what you're doing. Uh, on the left, you can see a picture of uh, one of our models, and that's actually for indoor farming. And you can grow a variety of, of crops, such as uh, leafy greens, herbs, and brand crops. And uh, uh, just for a very non-technical explanation, uh, you can see on the picture here, it involves uh, an hydroponic system that you can grow a variety of crops. And then we bring the Internet of Things technology inside to collect and uh, send information about the parameters that influence the growth of the plant. Those can include pH and the nutrient level and temperature and others. So you get the information about the status of those parameters right in your phone, right when some, uh, whenever there is a change, you get the notification right on your phone or on your computer. So you are actually able to know that something has changed, something is happening right when it happens. And this is uh, a scale of the systems that we, uh, we develop. There's uh, uh, indoor farming. They also uh, commercial systems that has different crops. You can see these uh, leafy greens and brain crops, which is a uh, tomato on the right. And this, uh, this is a list of crops that you can grow using this um, system that we develop. So that's just a brief note of uh, what we do as a company. And I thought it's important to show you that uh so that you you know that we are discussing this as practitioners and uh we actually have personal interest in seeing that technology is uh fast tracking the the changes in the agricultural sector so getting into the into the topic about how can technology disrupt the the agricultural sector with regard to the covid-19 COVID-19 pandemic, I would like to, get, to take you a little bit back uh, on the journey we've had, not as uh, Tanzania or Africa, but as uh, human beings. We've come a long way from the first industrial revolution to the second industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, and now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. In the first industrial revolution, you can see people used to, to use hand holes as uh, the tools to farm and practice different agricultural uh, activities. In the second, people were able to advance a little bit and they start using multiple plows. And in the third industrial revolution, people have been able to develop different machineries that help them to actually perform agriculture better. And all these stages, revolutions has already happened and we are currently in the fourth industrial revolution. And when we say fourth industrial revolution, we mean digital and uh, uh, technological solutions uh, and the modern technologies. And those are the ones that we are looking, how are they complementing the agricultural uh, value chains with regard to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, to just provide uh, context, you see this is uh, Africa's agritech landscape, and uh, it shows like hundreds of companies. And it's not it's not all that that are available in Africa. There is actually more than this that are using different technological solutions to solve something in the agricultural sector. And this have existed. Actually, this map was uh, produced by. Uh, by Brita Bridges with uh, collaboration with, in collaboration with uh, CTI, and uh, it was produced last year. And then this year, COVID-19 came, 
we've seen a lot of uh, companies, a lot of uh, value chains in, in agriculture were distorted, we are, were dis disrupted by the pandemic. And now the question is, all these companies are offering different solutions at different scales across Africa, but the sector has, was still largely affected by the pandemic. Now my, my question is, um, are those technologies really relevant to what's on the ground? Are they solving real problems? What, what loopholes did the, the pandemic uh, unveil in those technologies? Because actually most of those who are practicing these technologies are youth, are the ones who are tech savvy. And now my other question will be, are, are the youth way to fancy, like people talk about blockchain, people talk about internet of things, people talk about automation and uh, artificial intelligence. Now that we have panelists who are actually doing uh, are on the ground, doing things on the ground, like Samsung is well experienced. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline has been doing a tremendous job in the horticulture in Tanzania, and even John. So can you guys tell us, this is the question, and what what is the for, way forward? Like, are those technologies that are being practiced by the youth that we see here on this screen, are they relevant? Are they providing real solutions? And how do they match with what has happened uh, in the COVID pandemic? And how can we complement? How can we harness? How can we capitalize on those that are working give, uh, in, with regard to your own experience? That you've had in the in the agricultural sector working for years. So, uh, my role here is actually to introduce the topic, but also to pose a question on what are we actually supposed to do, given all these resources, all these people, all these companies and technologies. What can can we do better that the the pandemic has taught us? Thank you and. Uh, I would like to end here. Thank you so much, Craigwood, for the keynote. And I'm loving the icebreak. As in, he already sparked the conversation that is going to happen with the panel. So on to you, Daniela. So Daniela will be uh moderating the panel so terrible hello everyone i hope you guys are well today can you guys hear me properly just a, a nod will be great <laughs> great um so thank you everyone very good thank you very much for the uh, introductory keynote speech um i think the challenge and the question at hand really sits is really speaks for itself um, we've seen the growth of agritechs over the agriculture value chain over the years, and but with the um, emergence of COVID, um, the shock that COVID has brought into the market, we've seen a lot of loopholes that were that that emerged, the uh, pain points that really made the, the value chain not be very efficient. And what we are going to address today is what role has the technology has in in building resilience and the recovery from the COVID um, um, impact on COVID on these agriculture value chains, but also what innovations are working? Why are they working? Are they scalable? And this is the conversations we're going to try to address today with the panel that we have. I'm going to try to introduce the panel. Um, kindly put your, um, just raise your hand if, you, if, if I kind of mention your name. We have Dr. Jacqueline Kindi. Um, he, she is um, the CEO of TAHA, which is the Tanzania Horticulture Association, which is a member-based organization um, um, aimed at advocating inclus for inclusive growth and compet competitiveness for the horticulture sector in Tanzania. Karibu sana, Dr. Jackie. We look forward to for more insight from you. Um, also, we have John Mundi, who is this, he's from Mercy Corps uh, in the Agrifin uh, department. Um, he is the Agrifin Country Program Director and the Digital Climate Smart Agriculture Advisor. And he's in a special uh, um, uh, 
program that he is the digit the respond the manager in East Africa for the locust and COVID digital re response. Um, and he has really, we're looking forward for more insights from him because they've done quite a bit of research on how the relevance of how innovation and technology can play a part in the recovery of, uh, in the agriculture value chains from, from the COVID um, shock that we've been seeing. Uh, our last panelist is Samson Ogbole. Um, he's from um, Farm Lab. He's a farmer, but also a team lead and lead trainer um, for the company. Uh, and Farm Lab is a soilless, uh, is, is an agri-tech company that promotes smart way of farming. Um, and the goal for it is to improve comfort, food, transfer of knowledge, and connect farmers to market opportunities. Uh, Karibu Sana, welcome, Samson, and we look forward for your discussion today. So I'm going to give the panelists just a, a couple of a minutes to kind of prop, uh, formally introduce themselves and go through exactly what they do before we dive in into the few questions that we have. Um, Dr. Jacqueline, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. And uh, it is my pleasure and honor to meet all of you uh, today. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very important uh, discussion today about technology in agriculture. I mean, we cannot move nothing in the industry without technology. So my name is Jacqueline Kindi, as introduced, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Taha, which as you put it very, very clearly, Daniela, we are the Apex private sector a member-based organization responsible for horticulture development and horticulture transformation in Tanzania. But I'm also chairing uh, the board of the of Taha companies uh, because apart from the association, we're also running commercial companies that are providing uh, support service to the horticultural industry in Tanzania and beyond. So we are running three commercial entities. Uh, one is responsible for logistics, that is Taha Fresh Handling Limited, but we're also running another commercial entity that is responsible for standards for compliance when it, I mean, uh, all to do with market access and also fresh to market, a company that is uh, playing an of taking role, connecting smallholder farmers to the market. So all inclusive and, and providing strategic leadership to the companies uh, here in Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. Sansana Daniela, and uh, nice to meet everyone here today. Uh, as Daniela mentioned, I'm the country director for Tanzania for the Agrofin program. Uh, I've been in Tanzania for the last uh, 18 months or so, but uh, this year, unfortunately, I'm, I'm now talking to you from the UK. Normally, I would be there in, uh, in Tanzania with you all. Uh, I've been uh, in East Africa for the last five years working on these themes and the Agrofin program has been in Tanzania for the last five years working with uh, the ecosystem of agriculture and private sector and public sector actors for uh, digitizing services for smallholder farmers. We um, as Agrofin specialize in digital financial and digital information service product design and technical support to partners to uh, deliver these solutions at scale to smallholder farmers. Uh, and most recently, as you mentioned, Daniela, I've actually been working outside of Tanzania, mostly in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria on the COVID-19 response and uh, the desert locust response, uh, specifically in Kenya and Ethiopia, where desert locusts were, where digital has played a huge role. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking more about that um, on the panel. That's perfect. We look forward to that. Um, Samson, over to you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure. Hi, Daniela. Good afternoon. Hi, Jern and um, Dr. Pleasure to meet everyone. So, yeah, I'm from a Samson of Bali, farmer from Nigeria. And what we do is we are an agri technology company. We believe that, um, number one, food production should not be seasonal because we understand that hunger is not seasonal. And to ensure this, we use technology to back up our processes. So from things like the use of um, soilless agriculture, such as hydroponics, aeroponics, aquaponics. Then we also use things like machine learning and AI to ensure that our systems are much more interactive, efficient, and to increase productivity and as well increase profitability. Then of course, we've also created a platform where we are able to take our produce to the market. Then we've also used um, blockchain to ensure that you can track our product in the market and track it back to us. So the whole idea of all of this is to ensure transparency in the value chain because we believe if the consumer can hold the farmer accountable, 
is going to ensure that we have higher worthy word now, dedication to ensure the health of food as opposed to just growing for profit. So thank you. I don't know if you got all of that. Thank you very much, Samson. Um, are we are we together? Just for checking a network check, just real quick. Are we together? Yep. Great. Uh, so, just to come in, to bring it back home. My name is Daniela Kwayu, and I'm the CEO and founder of Fema Agri. Uh, um, I'm a it's a digital platform, uh, digital agriculture investment platform that connects farmers into structured value chains for the purpose of facilitating finance in, in, in the sector for smallholder farmers. So enough about me, let's jump in into the topic at hand. I'll address this next question to Dr. Jacqueline. Um, so we've seen a, a really big disruption throughout the value chain um, when it pers persisting to COVID and how it's been able to really, the shocks that we've been able to see all across it from the input provider, input provision for farmers, production, productivity for farmers, but also all the way down to markets. Um, in, in, in your report uh, that Taha uh, uh, presented, it's called Tarifa Ya Thari Zahoma Ya Virusi Via Corona Katika Tatsnia Horticulture in, in Chini, Tanzania. You highlighted a, a, a few of these loopholes uh, in that report. I want you to take us through it. Where do you think, uh, what, what loopholes really emerged uh, for you in the horticulture sector during this COVID? And how do you think, um, um, have you been able to mitigate them? And then we'll go into how tech has a part to play into it after that. Dr. Jacqueline? Yes, Asante Daniela. Thank you very much for, for your question. Yeah, as mentioned, our responsibility as Taha, actually um, we are a multifunctional organization, but our activities are in three folds, okay? So number one, our, our role and responsibility in the industry is to ensure that we work with all the partners, including the government, to improve business enabling environment so that our people in the sector could actually transact the business meaningfully and smoothly with their counterparts, whether within Tanzania or across the border and, and internationally. And our second role is to capacity build our farmers. So we work on the ground to build capacity of our people, uh, expose them to innovations and technologies for improving production and productivity. And our third role, which is very, very critical, is actually facilitating market access. And this area, the third one, was actually, I would say, badly impacted by the pandemic. Why? Because uh, when you talk of horticulture, you are actually talking of perishable goods, you know, products that cannot stay for long. So it's vegetables. It's all about fruits and it's all about flowers. So you cannot actually keep them for long. And if we remember very well what happened at that particular time, most of the countries uh, we were actually, the, the air was not was locked. So we were actually not connected to, to the markets. And when you talk of horticulture, and especially in, a, in an emerging sector like Tanzania, horticulture is still an export oriented industry. So we do export a lot to of course the regional market, but also to Middle East and EU. So logistically we were crippled. And especially when um, the only airline that we used to rely on like KLM, the passenger flight actually stopped its operations in Tanzania. So we really had to work um, and to think and act beyond the box, making sure that you know business continue. And that is how we were actually able to bring in a freighter it was not easy, but we really managed to bring in a cargo freighter in the midst of pandemic so that our exporters could continue exporting. So that was all about external markets. So it was very, very difficult to connect. Even the, the plane that we were able to bring into Tanzania, Ethiopian airline, we were only able to service one route, you know, that is Tanzania Liege. And so when you look at the market that we have, we're actually uh, supplying uh, goods to almost 10 or more countries in EU and Middle East. 
So having one route, that was a big challenge to some of our, of our exporters. And as you know, we, we rely a lot to regional airports and ports for export. So there were border closure. If you recall very well, there are times that the Namanga border was closed. There are times that our trucks to, to Mombasa port were not actually, were not given access to the port. So it really disrupted um, the flow of business. And we really had to work 24 hours a day just to make sure that our containers are getting to the port, whether in Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, but also we are able to open the border when they are closed. We're actually in the front line uh, engaging, you know, at that time, it was not all about engaging with the, our ministry for inter for EAC or, or transportation, we really had to, to, to mobilize the muscles and engage at the regional level, until when we were able to really convince uh, the regional governments to open the, the borders for, for goods to, to continue flowing. So that was one aspect where we were actually uh, challenged. Another one, of course, we still rely a lot on imports from outside Tanzania. And here we are talking, um, we are talking technology. So for agriculture to really benefit from the technologies around the world, we really have to discuss the issue of availability, the issue of accessibility, and the issue of affordability. All these require proper enabling environment for the, the technology and the innovations to, to, to actually impact positively on our uh, on process, on, on our actors. So during that time, our people were actually not able, you know, to bring in goods. It was, it was impossible because of border closure. So yes, our country was not locked, but to some extent, we were actually missing, for example, packaging material and we could not actually import packaging material. We were missing biological control agents because the farms, we had to actually continue, you know, taking care of the plants, you know, during that time. So importation of goods and service was also a, a serious challenge during that time. And of course, there are so many other uh, issues. Uh, for example, uh, we, we work with farmers and if the exporters here are actually relying on supplies from smallholder farmers. And so that chain was also disrupted. Why? Because some of the farmers were not actually going to the farms because of the fear and because of, you know, so many other things, you know. So there are times that you have a crop in the farm, but you cannot tend it because of lack of labor. So some of those challenges were there, but as an organization, we really, really tried to make sure that we are not collapsing. And that was the time that we really had to gear up and engage a lot at different level and make sure that logistically we are okay and we never stopped exporting despite the challenges. Uh, we also, we were there engaging at the EAC level, at the, at the international level, making sure that, you know, even if there are challenges at the border, but still our containers and our, our river trucks could actually still continue. So our engagement, strategic engagement with the government, with the development partners um, went on well. And what I can say today is uh, we, we, we are, the industry is doing well. And uh, we are still accessing some of the markets. Of course, we, 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 lo we lost some markets. We lost some markets. Um, if you remember very well, COVID came in soon after the big uh, international trade show that, is, um, that used to happen in Berlin. So from Berlin, that, that was in March and April, March, we had already signed the serious market contract. We're actually just coming from the Berlin a fruit uh, logistic. So we already had a secured market and we were here trying to really try to mobilize production here and there to service the market. And all of a sudden COVID came in. And so we lost some of, of the contracts, but good enough, we are getting back to the, to the market and uh, we're still negotiating with, uh, with our people uh, internationally and, and regionally. So let me probably stop there and uh, I'll get 
I'll come back um, responding to you know other questions if if they're there. Hi, Daniela. Can you hear me? Hello, uh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. Sorry, my network is a bit, a bit of it's, it's a bit of an issue. But I, I, I really, I, I, I hear what you said on the networks on the input um, reliance and the border challenges, which I, I think were very prevalent in the market. So back to you, Samson. Um, being that uh, Taha is an actual organization, so there's a member organization. Uh, sorry, I think Daniela has an internet issue, so we can give her the benefit of at least a minute to fix it. I think she's back. Hello. Okay, she's Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Daniela. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Apologies again. Uh, so just to bounce back on that, Samson, um, from a startup level, um, um, how have you guys seen this? Um, you guys are in the same um, um, industry per se, in the horticulture um, 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 space. How have you seen the, the shocks that have been happening? Have you been uh, going through the same things and how, how have you been able to pivot? How have you been able to use tech to be able to reach your customers? Has the supply issue been also a problem for you or were, you, um, were your market based locally? And how were you able to, 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 to survive around uh, with, with the COVID um, okay. happening within the ecosystem. All right. Thank you so much, Daniela. So um, the issue we had was, um, so basically as a farm, we are set up to sell to aggregators and distributors, set to aggregators and distributors. So with the whole COVID-19, it was a big issue because the distributors could not move, the aggregators could not move. So for the first few weeks into COVID-19, we had a lot of produce that we had to be giving out for free since we could not push it to the open market because that was not our initial business model. And luckily over time, they allowed the essential workers to move, which meant that we could move our products around, which meant that we could move our products around. So that was what we started with. And um, luckily, uh, now, what we've been able to do to ensure that even if there is an issue like that again is we've been able to have like a direct B2C, that's business to consumers, such that we now have uh, smaller packages that can go directly to families. So, for example, a few weeks ago when we had the whole NSAS movement, despite the fact that there was lockdown, we were still able to sell our produce because now we have a direct link to cost to consumers, as opposed to before now that we only sold to business organizations, but now we can sell to consumers. And another thing that has also helped us is the fact that we are doing hydroponics. Our farms are not so far into the villages. We have our farms around urban areas, and this ensures that it is easier for the market to come to us. So unless there is a major disruption, we are able to get to the market easily, sell easily, so yeah, that's been the way we've been able to use technology to avoid some of the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think that's quite um, um, insightful to see the different perspective from a startup level to an association level, how um, uh, the disruption in using through the COVID intervention has been able to, how you've been able to survive and how you've been able to use tech. So coming to you, John, um, I hope you guys can hear me. Yes, I can hear. 
John, um, you come from Mercy Corps, and 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 I'd like you to speak more or less on the research you guys have been doing, especially your role as the um, um, response for the locust COVID locust and COVID digital response um, in East Africa. How has what has come out of your research in terms of how technology can in addressing uh, the disruption and moving forward, building resilient agriculture value chain, resilient agriculture value chains, and also how can we recover from um, um, how can this inter how can this disruption be resolved? Um, if you can shed more light into that and how what what were your findings, that would be very very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that while. COVID has severely impacted logistics and supply chains uh, and the agricultural system across uh, the world, uh, let alone East Africa, uh, as I think Dr. Jacqueline really uh, framed so well. Um, there's also been an upsurge in interest in digital technologies because just by the nature of a pandemic, it's harder to move around uh, globally. Um, most of the field teams uh, back in uh, February, March extension services, uh, logistics movements were in doubt. Um, not all of it shut down, but a lot of it was in doubt. Uh, markets uh, became harder to access, as Dr. Jacqueline uh, rightly pointed out. And there was a lot of concern on behalf of farmers about what was going to happen. And so to reach large numbers of farmers in a short space of time with services and information they need, digital seems like the ideal uh, solution. Um, when we say digital response effort uh, in, in AgriFin's world, what we've been doing is uh, mostly public information work around uh, mass media approaches, traditional media like TV and, and uh, radio on what uh, Desert Locust look like, uh, what Desert Locust is, what COVID-19 is in, in, uh, in Kenya and Ethiopia and Nigeria mostly. Uh, and we deployed uh, SMS, IVR, WhatsApp, uh, every, every communications channel within the digital space to help inform approximately 16 million farmers about uh, what, what these dual threats were to their livelihoods. Um, what's been interesting as a result, uh, and some of our research uh, in the process of this kind of rapid response on, on information has been is farmers have requested a lot of, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of tailored information to their needs. So what is COVID-19 as it relates to farming activities, right? It's not always about the public health issue, but it was also about all of the logistics and supply chain issues. Is my market going to be open? Do I have to wear a mask on the farm? Do I, how do I clean my um, implements um, as it relates to this? Can I still um, act, uh, actively seek inputs in the same shops, et cetera? So there's all kinds of really complex uh, questions to what is a seemingly um, singular public health issue in COVID-19. There are all these questions around it. So I think what, one of the things that we found in this campaign um, as a result of these kind of specific information requests is what are the digital channels that farmers will trust and who, who should be saying this information? Obviously, governments play a very important role, but then which channels really change behaviors and really help farmers uh, get the information they're requesting? We found that TV and SMS were still kind of the two most trusted channels on some research in Kenya. This isn't uh, Tanzania, this is research from Kenya. So we can make some interesting conclusions from that. As the pandemic rolled on, uh, what we found is farmers are less interested about COVID-19 information, desert locust information, because the emergencies are less scary than they were uh, originally. And actually input supply chains, as, as rightly noted by both of uh, all of you, are, are um, really a huge issue. In Kenya, the, some of the research that we've seen there, um, farmers are reporting a 40% increase in input prices. 60% of farmers are saying they can't purchase the inputs that they want for the short rains uh, in Kenya um, for, for planting. You know, there are major issues that they're asking about. And they're also asking about fall armyworm, other pests and diseases that are not being attended to while extension services are focused on locusts and other issues. Um, so I think, you know, there are all of these really important needs that farmers have always had. Um, but they're becoming much more acute because of this crisis. And digital can only be one part of the solution where, you know, you've got 
uh, trusted information channels, yes. You could have some digital financial services. You could have some intermediaries um, digitize many of their services. But the role of uh, Samsung and uh, his business uh, in Nigeria and also the Taha Association in Tanzania is still critical. And so my final last thing to say is our research is also showing uh, huge liquidity constraints, both for farmers and the intermediaries within farming associations and businesses that serve farmers. And banks and the international financial sector um, have have start, have turned off the tap of finance. And that's a really big problem for the next couple of years. And we're uh, working to see if we can, um, you know, design solutions around that. But there's only so much design and digitization you can do uh, to unlock finance. Over. No, I think you've, you've, you've spoken very well in terms of uh, highlighting the, the, the innovations that can come up from each part of the value chain. I want to still stick with you, John, and then I'll come back to Dr. Jacqueline in a little bit. There have been an emergence of a lot of last mile distribution um, 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 platforms um, which cater to um, addressing the logistics challenge. We can't be out in the streets. We can't um, due to COVID um, restrictions and COVID curfews. How do you see these um, models being sustainable? How do you see these models uh, scaling up? And also coming back to um, um, Dr. Jacqueline, how do you, what innovations do you see out there that are existing that can help an organization like an organization like Taha? Um, and what, how do you see them being resilient in terms of um, scaling um, to improve sustainability and also to improve your logistics issues that that you've been facing throughout this this, this pandemic issue? Um, starting with you, John. Thanks very much, uh, Daniela. Um, and uh, Mercyful Agrofin has done some research on this, as you have mentioned, and, and it's online uh, um, that we can uh, we can share to the the various people on this call after. Um, I think logistics and markets in general, which and logistics are always usually part of markets and and input supply chains. Um, are essential and often an overlooked part of the digitization agenda, partly because, you know, you need trucks and people to still move things around. You can't just do that on your mobile phone, but you certainly can optimize it and, and increase efficiency gains, uh, transparency, formal uh, data systems to be able to reach the last mile and actually expose the value that's there with farmers to the private sector uh, through, through digital and data systems. Um, so one of the things that we found in a recent report we did with Dalberg is that um, there, there's approximately 28% of a profit gain that farmers can get from various logistics services being optimized, whether or not it's uh, a market access logistics service like Tula, or whether it's a tractor leasing logistics service like Hello Tractor, uh, you can have a, a number of a suite of logistics services that are uh, semi-digitized, that are connected to other services. And I think that the most important message on, on logistics is that um, there are lots of things that we can still do to innovate around how to do this best on, on mobile and digital, but it has to be a bundled solution. We, we see uh, logistics, markets, inputs, finance, all as a, as a bundled suite of services for farmers. And it's much easier to do if it's not just a standalone service. It's much more sustainable if information, logistics, markets, and inputs is part of the same bundle of services through a bundle of partnerships who are collaborating on all of those issues. No, no one or organization can do everything on its own. Uh, and so I think that's that's what we've seen in the logistics market. It's a very hard thing to do on its own, but it's a much easier service to do if you're in addition to an off taker, uh, in addition to a financier, in addition to an information services uh, for, for farmers. No, perfect. I, I totally agree in terms of it needs to be a very end-to-end -end integrated approach of dealing with value chains, connecting the logistics to the input provider, to the financier, to the market, and, and really controlling that entire value chain. So, Dr. Jackie, over to you. Um, what, what, what have you, how do you, where do you take from what John, John has said? How can these innovations really help um, um, your system? And also just to touch on that, if you can add, where do you see the play, a place where youth can play a part in, in, in engaging with, with, with solving, using technology to solve problems that organizations like Taha or other farmers or other agriculture value chains have been facing? Um, thank you, Daniela. And um, 
I agree a hundred percent to uh, what John actually mentioned, because if we are to create sustainability and resilience in the value chains, we really need to take the I mean a holistic approach in whatever that we are trying to achieve on the ground. So if it's about logistics or transportation, you don't just uh, go to that segment and try to solve issues there. You really have to take the big picture and try to actually come up with a solution that's actually a touch across you know, the value chain. So in terms of uh, uh, the technologies that could add uh, a lot of value in, uh, in the hot cultural industry, for example, I will talk of uh, digital technology. Uh, currently, what we are seeing in the in the industry today is that there is a significant increase in number of people who are interested to invest in the hot cultural industry. And many of these people are actually in the rural areas. And so for us to be sustainable or for us to improve efficiency in terms of servicing them, in terms of reaching out to them, we cannot continue relying on physical reach out driving vehicles uh, to actually meet farmers and train them. I think it is high time that organizations like Taha uh, come up with uh, the strategies or mechanisms to digitalize, for example, the extension support services, so that we are able to actually improve our efficiency and reach out to so many numbers of, of, of our farmers out there, but in the most cost effective, cost effective manner. So one of the technology that is missing, and I think it is high time that we as practitioners have to come up with a, a mechanism of introducing the technology is actually digital extension support system. Another area that I think needs to be very well checked and is about information technology. And especially when it comes to market access, because we, we have, for example, young people, like in the horticultural industry, we, we see a paradigm shift whereby there are so many number of young people who are now coming into the industry and they're interested in investing in the hot cultural industry. So they need to be guided very well. So we really need to have a, a robust uh, information system like market information system, you know, and other type of information system to actually e equip our farmers, especially youth and women on what, what is required of them. Uh, the markets are there, for example. And so these people need to be connected to the market. They need to be advising on where the market is. So they need to be advising on the prices, um, current prices in the, in the market. So that when traders come, they are empowered to actually negotiate meaningfully with traders. So market information systems, for example, needs to be very well checked. And when we talk of market information, for, for example, we at Taha, we are running the MIS, the market information system. But the weakness that I see personally in our, in our system in the, in the country like Tanzania is that our system is not very well integrated with the public, with the, with the government information system. So how do we really make sure that, you know, the information that we are collecting is telling very well with, with the information, for example, that the government, the Ministry of Agriculture is, 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 is collecting. So are the systems harmonized? So we really need to come up with these systems, especially information systems that are very well harmonized, that could actually add value to our people. And again, when you talk of logistics, um, uh, it's very, very important that we, we, we talk of technologies that will help our people to maintain the cold chain. Again, you talk about culture, it's all about perishables. So how do we really reinforce our cold chain management system right from the farm to the consumer level. How do we integrate all these segments across the chain? Because when we talk of market information system, or you know, not, not in market, but when we talk of quality chain management system, you actually have to, you have to involve an array of stakeholders, even the police who are actually stopping vehicles on the road. You really have to, to, to involve the way bridge. You really have to involve TRA, uh, the port, the airport. So how really can we come up with a technology or a system that brings all of us together so that we are able to come up with a, a cold chain management practice or system in Tanzania that is pro horticulture export. And just for your information, for example, we are now implementing uh, a study. We are conducting um, 
a logistic study whereby the, the, the objective of this study is really to check what are the issues in our ports and, and, and airports, for example. Why is it that our exporters are still relying on ports and airports from neighboring countries and we are not using Dar es Salaam? We are tracking uh, containers all the way from Jombe, from Bea to Mombasa, while we have Dar es Salaam port. Why is it so? So we are coming up with a study and we've commissioned that study to a serious logistic um, expert who is actually helping us to check our competitiveness in terms of what we offer in Tanzania and what others are offering in the region. So in this study, we are not only looking like inward, we are also checking the, the situation in Kenya, ports and airports, the situation in South Africa, Ethiopia and Egypt. And then we compare ourselves with the others. And that is how we are able really to advise the government on what needs to be improved in terms of quality chain management uh, at the ports and airports. So these are some of the initiatives that Taha and partners are implementing. And I am sure when you talk of technology advancement, the area of cold chain management is very, very critical and it should be prioritized if we are to transform horticulture, taking horticulture to the next level. Another area I think is the area of data capture, which John has also highlighted. Today, I'm, I'm just coming from a meeting with any, uh, National Bureau of Statistics, BOT, and, and TRI. And you would imagine that we don't have a system, a, a big country like Tanzania, with a, a fastest growing sector like horticulture in the country like Tanzania, we don't have a robust system to collect like production data. So our system are there, but we are still operating what we call um, uh, like, um, we, 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 we operate it in segment. It's not integrated. So we are not looking at what kind of technology could actually be deployed so that public and private sector can come together and be able to capture production data, export data for uh, uh, industries like horticulture and other subsectors in, 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 in agriculture. So I would say those are the priority uh, areas. But again, for us or for our farmers, especially youth, to comply with the requirements in the market, we need like technologies, uh, agro imports. Today, we are not keeping our focus on pesticides only. We are talking of biological control agents. So are these products available in Tanzania? How can we improve our system so that the biological control agents that are very, very in favor of our environment and, and, and human health are actually available to our producers, including youth and women in the sector? So all these technologies are out there, but I think it is the responsibility of us and other facilitators to create a enabling environment so that people could come and invest in Tanzania, producing those kind of technologies, or give opportunity for those who are out there to actually import them smoothly uh, for the use by our, our practitioners. And you have asked me about um, you. Daniela, I would say that, yes, if there is that perception that agriculture is a no-go zone for young people. I would say in the past few years, we are actually seeing like, like a paradigm shift in the industry. We are seeing a significant number of young people investing in the hot cultural industry. Why? Because one, of the, it's, the horticultural industry has a uh, short uh, return on investment. So 90 days, 120 days, you have invested and you have pocketed money in your, in your pocket. What needs to be done now in the sector, I think we need to reinforce our extension so that we continue building capacity of these young people. But again, and this is very, very important, we, we need to continue creating enabling environment for these young people who have dared to invest in the sector so that they, are, they can stay in business. Maybe let me end it there and then I'll come back if I'm asked another question.
No, thank you very, very much. Um, sorry, guys, I had to move to a less sunnier location. Uh, no, thank you very much, Dr. Jacqueline. I think you've hinted on some very crucial parts and the level and, and of, of the massive opportunity of employment for the youth also being part of that, that conversation that you just had. There's a lot of opportunity for digital extension services for youth. There's also an, a big opportunity for youth to innovate. Um, I think um, Prego, in the beginning of the slide, he mentioned how if we're going to move to the fourth industry revolution tech has to play a part of it and in my opinion tech innovation and the youth go hand in hand it has to be driven and cultivated by the youth now in terms of disrupting and, and creating resilience across the value chain um, technology youth the youth and the tech plays a really big part in, in, in creating those ecosystems and supporting the agriculture value chain so that we can able to withstand and withhand these shocks that are happening, especially within the COVID. And I think that's really good. Um, just to bring it back to Samsung now. Um, so with with uh, the insights that we've seen from Dr. Jacqueline and, and, and John, you being, I, I believe, a youth yourself, what are the uh, opportunities you see youth need to take advantage of within the horticulture sector, beyond the horticulture sector within the tech space especially being that we're, we're we're looking into how tech can manage the agriculture value chain and be able to to withstand the resilience within uh, within that ecosystem how do you think um, can we get uh, the youth to get more to be more engaged what are the opportunities that lie in in getting the youth and galvanizing the youth to try to solve this 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 problem that we are seeing and so it can so we can transition out of COVID and also build stronger resilient ecosystems and agriculture value chains. Samson, over to you. So thank you so much, Daniela. So the first area I see the youth coming in is access to market. Now I say access to market because typically for most African countries, what we have is we have so much production capacity, but we also have high waste between the farms and the market. So the youth can come in by creating channels to ensure that it is easier for consumers to access this product. One, it could just be by the um, creation of digitalized platform, like an app where people can order for food, um, an app that even helps the farmers to know what is required and when. That is an option. Number two is come into the area of branding and packaging. So for example, we have a whole lot of food going to waste. So what if we have these tomatoes, the pepper, the vegetables, packaged in a way that they have a longer shelf life. For example, with tomatoes, having just a thin layer of wax around them can make the tomatoes go from a one, two week shelf life to as much as four, five week shelf life. So they can come in in the area of packaging and branding. This way they are able to push this product to bigger markets. And it's like, number three is, acting as extension workers to rural farmers. This would also go a long way. Number four is domesticating foreign technology so that they are able to use local materials to replicate the same technology and get the same result. So that is um, number four. Number five is youth can actually work with local farmers to ensure that they collect data that would help the industry to actually have record of what works and what does not work. So these are some of the few ways that I believe that youth can plug into the agricultural value chain to ensure that we can do way more than what we are doing right now. The youth do not necessarily have to go to the farms themselves, though that also is an option where they can also decide to go to the farm, have farms closer to the city, as opposed to having farms in way rural areas. Then number six is, digitize the process of food production. By that, what do I mean? If, for example, there is a farmer in Tanzania, a farmer in South Africa that has issues with their lettuce, everybody tries to find their local solution. But imagine there is a platform where you have records from different parts of the continent coming on the same platform. Now, if anybody has an issue, they can easily log onto that platform, get solutions and replicate the same thing in their different um, locations. So, Youth can build platforms like this and charge for people to subscribe to such platforms. Then you could also have such platforms that also help people to grow vegetables in their homes, such that we have home gardens to domesticate food production, especially for highly, highly perishable products. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Samsung. Um, I'm going to get back. I think you've mentioned some really great points. Uh, in light of time, we have a few questions Thank that are you. coming up. Yes? Sorry, can I just bring this up? Uh, we The time is almost over. Can we please give just one minute for each question so that we can do the closing? Right. Yeah, no, sure, sure thing. Um, so I'm going to read out the questions really quickly and then please um, just one minute for the answers so we can be able to close up with Jumane at the end. Uh, so first of all, um, first question is from um, Wombeki. Um, can digital platforms help to address the liquidity and uh, market challenges brought by, about by COVID? What is the missing, what is missing for platforms to more to be more meaningful to do this? Are there developments out there um, to significantly influence uh, future supply chains? Um, I, would, I would address that to perhaps John. Would you mind taking that on? Thanks, uh, that, that's a, a big one to answer in one minute and uh, I, I would expect nothing less from one Becky. We have uh, faith in but, you, John. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the, the short answer is, is yes, to some extent, digital platforms can help liquidity constraints. What can they do to do that um, in a more meaningful way? I, I think it's actually on the, it's within the financial sector. I think there are structures for innovative financial mechanisms that we could uh, help co-design to see uh, better um, holistic financial vehicles for, for digital agriculture initiatives. Um, I think more flexible funds uh, for that more blended finance between public and private sector is probably needed to help bridge the gap. Um, I think some of the developments that can significantly influence future supply chains, supply chains in this fashion, commodity exchanges, market systems that we've worked on together, but also traceability. I think blockchain and cryptocurrencies do have a huge potential for this, although very nascent. Um, and uh, so those are just a few thoughts. Uh, but I thought Samson himself also captured a lot of that really well um, in, in some of his remarks. No, thank you very much. Uh, we have a new another question back to you, John, again. Uh, this is from Bert. Um, uh, his question is, John, made, made mention of the leasing equipment such as tractors. We're involved in grain storage facilities and a few other facilities such as cassava, animal feed product, and maize milling. The question I have, do you think there's a possibility or need to offer silo storage facilities on a lease basis? Um, it's a little bit out of the context of what we're talking about, but I think we can give him one more minute to, to, to answer that. John? Uh, yeah, I can take less. I mean, yes, it's needed on a lease basis, but I think I would combine it with warehouse receipting systems, Internet of Things, and go a step further and see if we can digitize some of those uh, storage programs. But we've seen farmers store way more crop because one, they can't access the market or they want to be more food secure for the next year. And so storage is becoming an even bigger issue now. Over. No, thank you. Thank you very much. One last question, unless we have another one. One last question is um, from Mr. Mombeki again. When COVID came about, platforms like MS Teams, Zoom and Amazon were the most part able to seamlessly accommodate the emerging needs. Where do agriculture platforms need to be in order to be ready to respond to the challenges brought about by COVID? What are the lessons, if any, from the Zooms of the world for other potential platforms to respond to the emerging needs from COVID-19? Um, I would say that can go to both Jacqueline and perhaps uh, Samson or anybody else in the panel who would like to, to lend a, a, a few, a minute or two of, on, on, on this before we close up. Are we all shy? I'm trying to read the questions. Right. So where do agriculture platforms need to be in order to be ready to respond to the challenges? So the resilience uh, brought about by COVID-19 and what are the lessons, if any, from the likes of Zoom and the likes of Amazon um, for, for the other potential platforms to respond to the emerging needs? What can we learn from Zoom and Amazon and MS Teams on their ability to be agile and respond quickly to the challenges? And, and, and how do we see that happening for the agriculture platforms that are existing? I think if you ask me, I would say um, the lessons that we have picked from um, uh, uh, Zoom and Amazon 
is that um, there is a need really to reinforce our, our, our systems, especially the marketing systems. Because for them, uh, what was actually their competitive advantage was uh, the robust, you know, the marketing system. Despite what was going on um, around the globe, but they continued to do business because of their, the system that they had. So it is very, very imperative that uh, when it comes to market access, one, internally and you know, at the country level, we really reinforce our, 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 our market access systems, especially the logistics. But also we have to learn, especially the developing countries, we have to learn a lot on e-business. You know, because we have been relying a lot on physical, you know, movement of goods and service, uh -huh. moving cargo from Tanzania on containers to Dubai and to the market. But I think companies that stayed in business are those that were able to move things online. So value addition is also critical for, for product, for agriculture sector because you cannot move, you cannot really uh, be able to withstand uh, the shocks brought about by the pandemic if you rely too much on exporting raw material. So I think it is very, very important that we start thinking of you know, adding value to our products. So instead of exporting, um, a pineapple or exporting avocado, then we think of start exporting puree or guacamole because they can stay long, you know, and you can even keep them. Even if there's no business today, then you can ship tomorrow. So I think those are the lessons that I've picked from some of those uh, technology companies like, uh, like Zoom and the rest. Value addition, but also reinforcing the market. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacqueline. Now, I'm, I'm aware that we are out of time. And so we, I would like, to, first of all, to thank every, all the panelists for participating. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Jumane Mutambalike, our CEO for uh, Sahara Ventures, to give us some closing remarks on the panel that we've been um, 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 in conversation and the topic that we've been in conversation about today. Jumane, over to you. Uh, we have about a couple of minutes, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I hope you can hear me, guys. First of all, I'm just giving closing remarks. And I'm a techie and an engineer, so I'm, I'm bad with protocols, just in case I forget anyone. But we appreciate the support and the partnership we've been having uh, from Agritech. This has been a very good uh, partnership. Uh, we started to work with Agritech a couple of years ago. They were part of our accelerator, e -Kilimo Accelerator. And I'm very proud of them, the way they're becoming and the influence they're starting to have in the agri-tech ecosystem in Tanzania. So that's the first one. Uh, the next thing, I'm also very excited about the conversation and we need to have this kind of conversation more and more because Africa currently is transitioning and for better for us to capitalize the agriculture sector, we need to uh, leverage uh, future and existing technologies and try to bring them in the agriculture value chain. Africa is getting more urbanized 15 of the fastest growing cities are uh, in the continent. My hometown, Dar es Salaam, is expected to attain mega city status by 2030. We'll have more than 12 million people living in Dar. We cannot continue to depend on traditional farming systems to feed the people in Dar es Salaam. Uh, the production needs to come closer to the consumers. Uh, we need to have more efficient productive processes. We need to find platforms that can improve market access. So this conversation needs to continue at the organizational level, at the institutional level, but most importantly, we need to build an ecosystem. We need to build an ecosystem where startups work together with government, work together with research institutions, academic institutions need to play a role. We need to bridge the gap uh, in terms of technology transfer and research commercialization, um, good ideas and projects needs to move quick to the market. So I'm very excited with the future of agri-tech in Africa. And again, let's keep the fire burning. Let's continue to have this conversation. Part of the Africa Beyond 2020 week in which this event is organized, 
There are still some events um, you can register to attend, www.saharasparks.com. It's a lot of conversation around agri-tech, around health tech, around future skills. And this is the whole point of having this platform to be diverse people from diverse background to try to see how technology, which is just a tool, by the way, we need to be very careful. Technology is just a tool to find a way to use this tool to be able to improve different sectors across the continent. Thank you so much and enjoy your afternoon for those who are in Dar es Salaam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jumane. Thank you very much, all our panel speakers, Dr. Jacqueline, John, and Samson. Um, I look forward to further engagement beyond just our meeting today and also pray God. Thank you very much for uh, organizing such a very fruitful and, and, and engaging conversation with really, really great points that we highlighted today. Um, I'd like to end the call there um, and I look forward to seeing you guys on the next sessions that Sahara Sparks has um, in, in, in the next sessions that Sahara Sparks has been organizing. So I look forward to seeing you guys there. Asante ni sana, karibu. Asante sana, Daniela Kwanevi. Asante. Okay.